welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those setbacks and failures that you've experienced or are experiencing right now, do not define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And I don't know many people who know that better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this program, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, we are in the midst of our uh, very robust series here in the spring on the Trials to Triumphs self-assessment. And this is going to be, based on the conversations we've had prior to the recording of this, is going to be another exciting one and another informative one, isn't it? Absolutely, Gary. Very much looking forward to it. And one of the things that makes it so robust, folks, is that joining us again um, in this discussion of the assessment is Cheryl Farr, who is the uh, founder and and chief strategist for Signal Brand Innovation. Uh, If I'm the co-host and Warwick's the host, Cheryl's kind of our our special guest star through every episode of this series. (laughs) So so Cheryl, we're going to have this, again, as I said, this is going to be a very interesting and informative conversation, I think. Well. I agree, Gary. I'm really glad to be here. So thank you. You're welcome. And folks, here's let me level set where we're at. Uh, We're going to be talking about our statistically valid trials to triumph self-assessment, which offers those who take it details of a personal journey that's a bit like an endurance run. There are no sprints to the finish line or ways to cut the track. You've got to do the hard work of moving through each stage of the journey from your own personal you are here, Mark, on that map. And you must do it at the speed that's right for you, what you've been through and where you're going. Hear this. It's not a competition. Everyone has their own clock. So please, I'll say it again, please feel no pressure to break the tape first. We've extended the running metaphor as an easy way to visualize the Trials to Triumphs roadmap and to understand its six unique starting points. This week, we're going to delve into the profile for running in place. Warwick, um, uh, let's get off the treadmill, as it were, and start moving (laughs) forward with our discussion, shall we? I'll turn it over to you to start asking our guest star some questions. (laughs) Well said, Gary. Well, Cheryl, again, welcome. Thank you for being here for the series. Uh, It's wonderful to have you. So today, we're going to be discussing running in place. And that's sort of an interesting um, profile. So let's start out by, uh, you know, tell us what running in place means. Warwick, running in place is someone who has accepted their crucible as part of their life. They've largely processed through the emotions of what they've been through. There might be some residual, you know, hurt, right? We're always holding on to the memory of our, the emotional memory of our crucible. But fundamentally, they're not really overwhelmingly angry or hurt anymore. They've really processed through those emotions. Um, However, they're also not quite, if they're not looking in the rear view mirror anymore, they're also not quite looking ahead yet either, right? They kind of have a neutral opinion. They're not sure if they're being held back by what they've been through. And they're definitely being held back in some way, right? The answer of I don't know means I'm probably being held back in some way. Um, So what that means is they're probably going through the motions of their life, of a life, right? They're going through motions, they're surviving, but they haven't yet hit the restart button. They haven't yet cast a new vision, a new post-crucible, let me say that again, post-crucible vision for life. Um, they, they are, they might be going through the motions of a life that maybe they're not quite suited for anymore. Um, it is kind of like running on a treadmill, right? You're running, you're running, you're running, but you're not really going anywhere. And I think that's what the running in place uh, metaphor is all about when it comes to this profile. I mean, it's a really interesting profile. You know, it, I think as we were talking about it, the concept that uh, struck me was they're really sort of surviving, not thriving. It's sort of like a, 
a life of gray rather than technicolor. And it's, they're not having, you know, pangs of panic or anger. It's just like, yeah, life's okay. It's, yeah, you know, whatever. That's just kind of what life's like. I'm just going along. But um, yeah, as you said, it's fascinating that they say, well, the, in a sense, the crucible uh, is not something that, you know, is really um, an issue in one sense, but yet they're not completely certain whether it's holding them back or not. So I think as we've, you've said, if you're not really certain, that could be an indication there's some residual strings, something that's, you know, keeping you on the treadmill and not getting you off the treadmill, if that makes sense. That's totally makes sense. You know, it's funny, um, in research, what they like to say is that if answers come, if people select on a scale that they slightly disagree with something, then that usually means they agree with it to some degree, right? Because it's like, <laughs> if you really disagree, you're going to be like, I disagree with it. I kind of disagree with that, which means there's some of it that you agree with. Neutral really coming to an answer of neutral, like I don't have an opinion as to whether my crucible is holding me back or not, means it probably is at least subconsciously, right? I don't feel like it's holding me back. I've been there. I don't know about anybody else, but I've been in that place where I feel like something's happened to me, the trajectory of my life changed, and I'm not really angry about it anymore. I've processed through the emotions, but I haven't yet quite figured out what comes next. And I think that's a real place for this person to, to be at is, you know, I haven't, like I said, not looking back anymore, but not quite able to look at, move ahead yet. And it's also interesting that the vision score for this profile, to your point, is somewhat low, right? If it's somewhat low, using the example that you used, it's probably pretty low if someone said my vision's somewhat low. So, you know, they are... As I was going through this, the, the phrase that leapt into my mind is they may be moving um, ahead. Things are happening for them a little bit, but they're not moving forward beyond their crucible, perhaps. And I think that's where the where the vision score being somewhat low, you know, it's like, oh, well, I don't know that I have a vision. If I do have a vision, I don't know that I'm I'm pursuing it. It's just, you know, to your point, Warwick, it's that kind of gray area that we that we kind of go through in the aftermath of something that's traumatic. Oh, 100%. It's kind of a liminal space, right? Where you um, you don't quite have a vision yet. You might be thinking about some ideas of what you could do, but they're really just ideas or thoughts at this point. You're not really ready to lean in and commit to to a vision yet. So that vision is somewhat low because it's probably not fully formed. And if your vision score is somewhat low, then your reality score is definitely low because until you have a vision and you're in the pursuit of something, it's really hard to know um, what to what to pursue. And keep in mind that some of the things of, of behind that vision score are not just do I have a vision, but I'm not sure if somebody says that their vision score, if the vision score is somewhat low, that means they're not sure if they have a purpose in life. They're not sure what legacy they want to leave behind, right? These are big, meaty questions. They've been, think about it, they've been sort of cast off track. The track has changed, but yet that new track hasn't been set yet, right? Mm. So. Yeah, that, that's so well said. I mean, in one sense, if they'd fully gotten over that crucible and there were no strings attached, and they were, you know, then you would feel like they would be moving ahead. Maybe they haven't got the vision or clarified, but there'd be a sense of optimism and a sense of, you know what, life is there to be seized, carpe diem, all that, seize the day. And, you know, you have to think, despite what they might say in one sense, it feels like if you've really fully gotten over it, you're just moving ahead, all guns blazing. Is that like reasonable? Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. And one of the other questions, there are four questions behind the vision score. Um, my life has purpose. I know what legacy I want to leave behind. Um, my life is heading in a positive direction. And I make decisions based on the guiding values of my life. So those are four questions. 
and think, look at this profile, the resulting score is neutral, an average of neutral. That means that's really caught. That feels like a place where you're caught, right? Because think about it, when you when your trajectory changes, when you say, well, I'm not sure if I make decisions based on the guiding values of my life, that probably means that have my values even changed? Has something happened that has that has made me even question my values, question my purpose, you know? And so when you're wrestling with those questions, it's really hard to move on. So unpack a bit what the person who gets this assessment might be feeling and going through, because you get this result that says you're running in place and it's like, huh, hmm, doesn't feel great, but what does it mean? I mean? What do you think they're feeling? as they're hearing these results and processing it? You know, I think they're probably feeling a bit out of sync with life, right? They're feeling a sense that something's not quite right. It's, I think it's less about overwhelming emotions, um, but not being excited, inspired, or inspired by any one thing. Really, not really, it's kind of, going through the motions. There might be a numb or a stagnant feeling, maybe a sense of even drudgery, like a getting up, doing the same thing again in the morning, making it through the day. Um, maybe it's fine, but it's not, it's not great. It's not exciting. It's not, it's not a day that's filling your bucket. It's one that might be draining your bucket. You know, I think um, you might be I think it's very possible to be in absence of knowing where to go next, to be clinging to the familiar. One of the things we know from um, study of the brain from neuroscience is that people tend to gravitate toward what is familiar, even if it's not comfortable, right? We tend to gravitate toward what is familiar, even if it's not making us happy or making us comfortable. Um, that's how our brain brains work. Our reptilian brains work. We gravitate toward the familiar. We gravitate toward routine, um, even if it's not serving us necessarily. But um, it's hard to know how to let go of the familiar if, for a potentially exciting unknown, if you're not sure of what that looks like, or if you're not sure of of if your internal compass doesn't know where to point yet, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's so well said. I mean, often the life you're living may not be great, but it's the only one that you've known. And mm -hmm. different feels scary. Uh, the unknown feels uncomfortable. So it's like, well, some people think our oh, life could be better. Uh, on the other hand, maybe folks here are thinking life could actually be worse. And if I make a change, you know, maybe it'll be worse. Maybe, you know, some people think, if I do this thing, the business is going to fail, the economy is going to, they think of all the reasons why it's going to fail, right? So let me yeah. just stay where I am because at least I, I, you know, it may not be fantastic, but I know what it is. If I do something else, the sky is probably going to fall. There's just this sense of, yeah, sort of a bit of doom and gloom about change. Well, fear of the unknown. We're all programmed to be somewhat afraid of the unknown. Um, that programming helps us in certain contexts, but it also holds us back in others, especially if that if we've already been through a trial or a trauma, um, and especially if that trial or trauma is of our own making, right? If we've failed at something, it's easy to not have the confidence to cast a new direction. And we haven't talked about this before. Uh, we've had, and This is what I love about this show is that we, we start talking about these things and then things pop into our heads and we come up with them. But what you just described of, um, it seems like if, if there was, of the profiles, if there was one that you could kind of just sort of sit down in <laughs> uh, and, and be okay, because it is about things are kind of okay, they're not great, they're not bad. This seems like the place where you could kind of go to disappear in some sense, right? If it, because it is familiar, it is uh, maybe easy in some ways. So you can, there's that, that there's a danger, right? Of, of just kind of sitting down and, and hunkering down and 15 years pass and you're still here if you don't do uh -huh. the work. 
a hundred percent, right? Because it's easy to say, I'm not going to take a risk on, maybe I've come out of divorce or I've lost a loved one. I'm not going to take another risk on love because it only hurts and, or whatever that looks like. And then hide. Yes. I mean, this is a profile while it may not be the most painful, it's also one you could get lost in for the rest of your life if you're not willing to do something about it, right? If it doesn't, if at some point the discomfort doesn't overcome the fear of the unknown. So let's kind of uh, look at this a bit further. And some assessment takers, you know, we've mentioned they might feel a bit downcast and they might feel like, okay, I get it running in place. I'm not really making any progress. And it's like, um, gee, you know, it's, uh, what do I do with that? Okay. I, I get what it means. I understand what I'm feeling, but what do I do with this result once I get it? First of all, as we like to say here at Beyond the Crucible, knowledge is power, right? Understanding where you are at on the path from trial to triumph is, is a powerful understanding. And a benefit of getting this result is the opportunity to examine where you're at, what's happening to you, and if you're ready to move on, if you're ready to really examine that and really ready to say, okay, what is the equation happening for me? Is this discomfort greater than um, my fear of failure, right? Is is my desire to cast a new purpose for my life, to cast a new vision, greater than my fear of change? And to ask yourself and to do that really calculus on where you're at in life, if you're ready, are you ready to move on? And I think that's where understanding this result and having the opportunity to examine. And then, of course, be able to say, okay, I, I don't have that vision yet, but what do I need to do to get there? And then really to, to get off, it's, it's sort of a getting off the treadmill moment. Right, I, am right, I right, ready right, to get right. off the treadmill and run on the road toward a vision and toward a new reality? Or am I not there yet? Right. But, and if the answer is honestly, I'm not ready yet. Then you can say, okay, I'm going to ask myself again in 30 days, or I'm going to ask myself again in three months, right? Because it's okay to not be ready, but the power of knowing where you're at and being able to self access and reflect on that and then make moves when you're ready to make those moves, I think is, is a huge achievement. Yeah, I like what you uh, said, Cheryl. I mean, knowledge is power, is understanding, okay, I'm running in place. Um, I'm living in the gray, I'm feeling numb, and beginning to ask yourself, do I want to live like this for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Maybe there's something better. Uh, and you might begin to ask yourself, it feels like something's holding me back, but what is it? And answering those questions, you know, I think you have to answer the what is holding me back before you can really move on. And that might, you know, as we've said in other um, discussions here, that might involve a therapist, a pastor, you know, somebody with spiritual wisdom or family friend. Those that know us probably are going to be have a pretty good answer of why, especially those that have known us for decades or, you know, people who are really train. And I say, well, maybe, you know, A, B, and C are holding you back. Maybe, have you ever thought about that? And Maybe you're still a little bit angry about this. It, it doesn't really come to the surface much. Every once in a while, it does. You know, I've seen it, little sparks fly. Most of the time, no, but I feel like there's something beneath the surface. But yeah, so asking yourself, are you ready? And if the answer is not really, then just delving into, delving into the why can be very helpful. You know... I think this is a case where, yes, a professional could offer assistance, but also trusted friends and family members, they may be able to tell you if you're willing to ask, they may be able to say, see you 
and know the pre-crucible you and say, yeah, you know, you've lost that spark you used to have, or no, you seem exactly the same, right? Because we all can hide things. But people who really know you can tell, uh, can tell you some things about how they see you and with love and respect um, and what's maybe what's been missing or what's different or what, um, uh, where, like I said, that spark might be gone, where that's not, where you're not standing in, where maybe in a past, in your past life, you were standing in a thriving and now you're just kind of in a surviving mode, right? Um, and are you ready to step back into thriving? This conversation reminds me, if, if you've seen the movie A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson, there's a scene at the end <laughs> where Jack Nicholson is, is kind of bloviating at Tom Cruise's attorney, and he says, you know, in that place inside you that you don't like to talk about at parties, you need me, right? I think what we're talking about here for people sometimes is that little, that, that, place inside them that they don't talk about at parties because that's where they feel that kind of the, the spark is gone they kind of know that they you know and to your point work that you mentioned all the time on this show do the inner work do some self-assessments of your in your own mind and spirit and 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 body and is that is that voice in that place that you don't really talk about all the time at parties is it telling you something's out of whack? You know, I think one of the good news is here, though, is and why there's reason to have hope, Warwick, is I think that whether or not what happened to you in the past is is your fault or not, or you played a role or you could have done better is irrelevant. You're in charge of the future. You're in charge of moving ahead. And that's in your control. And I think that's exciting, right? And this idea of being able to use, you know, I think part of the mindset shift here is understanding that now you are in control, no matter who is in control of what happened in the past, you're in control of your future. And I think this opportunity, there's a mindset shift here that I think, um, the person who's running in place um, can go through this idea of being able to see your crucible as something that has made you stronger. How has it refined you, right? This is something we like to talk about a lot at Beyond the Crucible is how do your crucibles refine you and make you stronger, smarter, more self-aware. And I think that that's an opportunity that, um, this moment of self-reflection and this moment of thinking about your mindset and what kind of shifts um, may, you can take has. Yeah, I mean, it's such a good point. Uh, it really is all about a mindset shift. Yes, you've got to do the inner work. Are there some strings in that crucible that I haven't dealt with? Uh, but there's also a decision saying, I refuse to let this hold me back. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to take risks, not jump off a cliff risks, but, you know, we talk about small probes, try some different things. You know, uh, often we think the sky is going to fall, but realistically, if you try a small probe, you know, talk to friends, advisors, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? And typically the worst possible thing that can happen is not that bad. If it's a moderate risk, a reasonable play, you know, maybe it's like you've been had a bad divorce. Okay, well, let's go um, with a group of friends with somebody that you might think there's a possibility. What's the worst that can happen with a group of friends and this person? Not a lot. You go have coffee with them. What's the worst that can happen? Boy, I was, you know, I was, you know, bored to tears. My gosh, you know, how could I have thought this person, you know, there was any compatibility? Well, you know, we're not talking a legal bill here. We're talking about a cup of coffee, <laughs> you know? Right. right. It's just like, what could possibly, so sometimes we kind of overblow taking these small risks. Your, your example of somebody going out on that first coffee date, even if it's a bust, you did it and you realize, oh, that wasn't so hard. It wasn't even that big of a deal. So I could do that again, right? And that's a huge victory in saying, 
I'm willing to start moving ahead. And I and realizing, hey, you know what? Even it was, though it was a bust and I would never want to see him again, it was kind of fun, right? And you start to realize by taking some small steps forward that your life can, be, you know, life can be in technicolor again, right? That there is a, a life. It may not look like the old life, but that there is that so much better life ahead that it doesn't have to be, as you said, say, stuck in the gray, right? Um, and what if now is the time to start thinking about what that new Technicolor life looks like? And is there an opportunity to now to see your crucible as it's a thing that happened to you? You probably never want to have it happen again, but it's still an opportunity. And if you can make that mindset shift to see it as a leaping forward point and get out of mindset limbo and say, okay, I'm going to start taking small steps to move ahead. As we all know, that's really the, where the flywheel toward casting a, a bigger new vision, that's where it starts. And, and none of the things that you just talked about, moving forward, Taking small steps, none of those, none of those things are happen on a treadmill. None of those things happen while you're in place, right? That's the beautiful part of what you're saying. And, and early on in this conversation, Cheryl, you painted a picture that was really interesting. You, when you're when you're running in place, you're not looking behind necessarily, but you're also not really getting forward. You're not going back. You're not going forward. You're just right here. And the the power of one small step is it is it, I mean, part of the mindset shift is. You start looking forward. You start moving forward. You start not in the rearview mirror, um, but looking ahead and moving forward. And, and, you know, back behind you, you can't change. Out in front of you is all kinds of opportunity, right? And and as you move beyond that crucible, out in front of you is, a. I mean, as we're sitting here right now, outside my windows, there's a lake and there's geese and there's actually uh, some... some um, some swans came in today and it's just all kinds of life and opportunity outside this window. That's where opportunity, life, getting out of running in place is forward. Well, and that forward, you don't have to, looking forward doesn't have to be the far horizon. It can be deciding that you're going to go out for coffee with a friend or you're going to go on vacation with a with with some with a girlfriend say or a group of friends or you're going to go join a pickleball league or a book club it can be small steps like that and and that's really important what uh what you're saying Cheryl and Gary um cuz sometimes when you're living in the gray and somebody talks about a technicolor life as a vibe that's just way beyond me i mean you don't have to start out with full technicolor pick a you know like a uh a light blue, a light green, just one itty bitty little color. Start painting one stroke. And it's it's interesting, Warwick, that as you say that, because we find this, so far we found this in every episode we've done. When you start talking about these things, we hadn't thought about them in advance, but Warwick Fairfax has has walked through some of these very footsteps in his bounce back from his crucible. And it is true, right, Warwick, that there was a running in place moment for you along your journey as you were coming back, as you were navigating your back, trying to figure out your way back from your crucible. So talk a little bit about that, um, what your running in place moment looked like for you. So a good part of the 90s, early 2000s, I was running in place. Just to give people the backstory, um, you know, I grew up in this uh, very large 150-year-old uh, media business in my family. I launched this $2.25 billion takeover. I felt like the company wasn't being well run. Run along the uh, ideals of the founder. Anyway, basically it didn't work out, uh, and it was pretty cataclysmic for me and obviously had some impact on a whole bunch of other people. So my wife's American, so we moved to the U.S. in late 1990. And, uh, yeah, for much of the 90s, I wasn't in a great place, uh, not clinically depressed, but was feeling, you know, what's life about? What's my purpose? So in 1996, I got a job in a local aviation services firm in Maryland. 
Uh, I worked there for six years, and that was a good step forward in a lot of ways uh, from where I was. But yet, when I was in that area, I felt like, okay, I don't know that my crucible is overtly holding me back. I realized some things I was responsible for, other things were beyond my control because there was infighting in the family for, for decades. So, you know, in one sense, I'd come to some degree of peace with my crucible, but I certainly wasn't thriving. I was doing financial and business analysis. I got good performance reviews, but I wasn't getting joy out of my job. It was a job. I was in a you know, cubicle, and as I jokingly say, not even a very good cubicle. It felt like for those on the East Coast of the U.S., there's a freeway I-95 that goes from Maine to Florida. It felt like I was on I-95. Everybody that walked through this part of the building went right past my cubicle. So, you know, it was okay, but it was like, it just wasn't great. I was living in the gray. And um, in summary, life wasn't terrible. It didn't suck. But, you know, I was just going through the motions and... um at least I felt like there was something I could do and not screw up. And so that was good. But um, I was definitely not thriving. I was surviving. I was, I was doing okay. I wasn't doing great, but I, I was fine. As they say, you know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Which typically there's a right. lot more to be said when you hear the word. I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. Right. If, if we had to create a bumper sticker for this profile, <laughs> for uh, running in place, I think it didn't suck would be a really good <laughs> bumper sticker for this profile, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. it's not good. It's not bad. It didn't suck. It was just, right. I mean, what you just said, right, that shows exactly what running in place feels like. Um, you could, good perf- you could add, yeah, I'm sorry. fine to the mix. You could right. add, I'm exactly. fine to the mix. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the good news, Warwick, the good news is that um, you're not there anymore. You got uh, you you were able to stop running in place and start moving forward. Um, how did that go about? What was the what was the impetus for that? And then how has that manifested itself? Continue to manifest itself in your life. I came to this point six plus years into this job where I kind of hit a wall. I felt like, and you know, faith is important to me. I felt like, in a sense. Something within, from my perspective, God was telling me that I was playing small and I was not using all the gifts that he had given me. And I think some buried in there, there was probably a sense of altruism, a sense of serving others. But being a person of faith, when I feel like it wasn't about arrogance, but you know, I feel like God or whoever we believe is our creator, we're given gifts and we're meant to use those. Playing small deprives the world, it deprives our friends of something that could help others, that can, can, you know, could contribute. So it's not about ego, it's about using who you are to leave a legacy, to, to, leave, you know, to make a contribution. So when I felt like, yes, I, can, uh, I could do financial and business analysis very well, I thought, but I was made to do more than that. And it's not so much you know, being beneath me or not beneath me, it just felt like I was playing small, and that was really it was a it was like an epiphany for me. It was a huge moment. So at that point, I felt like it was a call to action. Um, it was very uh, it was very motivating. Um, you know, I was getting in touch with my kind of inner values and what I believed was true, um, and uh, you know, I just basically. Uh, so I can't ignore this. And so I made a decision to, I didn't use these words, but to get out of the numbness. Um, I sort of realized I was playing safe, playing small, because my ego had taken such a hit. My confidence was very low. Um, I had gifts and abilities that I felt like could help others. So, you know, playing small didn't help me or didn't help others. So I just I just began to think, I need to do something different. And so my first step was I went to a woman who was an executive coach who did uh, mid-career assessments, and she did a you know a, a assessment of me and um, a variety of, of, of tests, and she said, you know, you have a great profile to be an executive coach. You know, I'm curious. I, I like to feel like I, I listen. So I did some research into the International Coach Federation, and they were having their annual conference in Denver in 2003. So I went to this conference 
And that conference, it changed my life because these were people that were curious. They were not judgmental. Uh, they were, I felt like I found my community. These are people like me. I mean, we're all very different in terms of backgrounds, but yet there was a commonality of thinking, a commonality of values and attitude to life. So I decided to become a certified, a trained International Coach Federation executive coach. And this was, this wasn't, I wouldn't say the ultimate, you know, fully orbed vision, but it was a key step on the way. It was a key step of moving out of the gray because being a coach led me to being on two nonprofit boards, you know, writing uh, my book, Crucible Leadership beginning beyond the crucible speaking podcasts but it was that decision to get out of the gray go to that executive coach that did mid-career assessments and then decided to become an executive coach myself as i was coaching people people said boy you know you really have a lot of thoughts about leadership and i would said at the time i couldn't lead my way out of a paper bag look what i did with the family media company that makes no sense and I said, I'm just asking questions. But somehow by asking questions, they could see I, I knew something about leadership. I never, ever would have thought that. If you told me that, I, I bet when you had a number of people who I coached and had conversations with said, you have a lot of wisdom and you really have some good thoughts about leadership. Eventually, I thought, well, it's hard. I can't dismiss all of this. It's just they can't all be wrong. So all of those things, baby step by baby step, not only did it give me a vision for my life, not a fully old vision, but a step-by-step. I also began to build back some blocks of my self-confidence that had been obliterated by the failed takeover. I mean, you had so much wisdom by going through such a major loss, right? And, And a major failure that could be so informative for the questions you could bring and the inquiry and the self reflection that you could spur in others. I think that is such a gift um, but it took a long time to be able to get there, right? And you needed to run in place for a little while. And that was part of the healing process. And, you know, it's interesting. You've used this term playing small for all the years I've known you. And, I, and I've always understood what it meant. But I think understanding this profile has unpacked that even more, right? While we're healing, there's a stage where we kind of have to cocoon a little, right? And keep ourselves in a safe spot until you're ready to move on. And like you said, there's a danger. You could have sat in that chair forever, right? Until you retired. But there was a point where the healing had happened and you were the, the, what was being lost by sitting there, was greater than the fear of figuring out and casting a new vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, uh, so I keep learning from your own story (laughs) as well, Warwick. Thank you. The, um, so I never thought of this either until you just said what you said, you were talking about um, playing small. And I've heard that many, many times on the show as well. And um, uh We've also talked about the the power of one small step, and in your story work, I mean, the two meet. It, it, the one small step is what propelled you out of playing small, right? Putting those two together, the the power of those two, right? You were playing small, but you one small step got you out of that, shot you out of that toward um, truly moving forward, not just um, uh, you know uh, running in place. You actually began to move forward into your calling because of that one small step and it propelled you out of playing small. Uh, And you're not the only one that we have on this show. It's, it's, it's always fun when you are one of them. And it'll be interesting to see as we go through every episode, if, if Warwick has, uh, has a story to tell of every profile, stay tuned folks. (laughs) We will, we will find out. We're not going to give you any hints, but stay tuned. If you want to know if Warwick has a profile that matches every one of our profiles, but we do uh, have several guests, um, uh, from previous podcasts who who fit this profile, who at some point in their journey from trials to triumphs 
uh, found themselves running in place. And the first one that I'm going to bring up is Esther Fleece Allen, who was uh, actually the first guest we ever interviewed on this show, Warwick, a, uh, a, a good friend of mine. And I'll just give the, sort of the overview of her story. She uh, overcame a traumatic childhood of abuse and abandonment, and she forged a successful career. Keep track of that word, successful, a successful career as a speaker and a writer. But then her dad, who uh, she feared, her dad, who had been emotionally abusive, who had abandoned her, uh, resurfaced and began to kind of trail her around in some in some ways, uh, stalked her. Um, uh, she realized her successful life had been built around something that was fashioned as a defense mechanism, right? She was running in place. She was, it was numbness and she built a successful life around that numbness. Um, and so she was moving ahead, but she was not moving forward as we've said before. And it was only by learning to lament the crucibles of her life and to learn what they could teach her, um, that she was able to begin living a life of true personal and professional significance. Um, uh, the, the beats of doing that work, I know, uh, have, have been meaningful, were meaningful to you from the beginning, but you know, her book, the book that helped her break that, helped her get off the treadmill was her first book called No More Faking Fine, Ending the Pretending. And that really was something that, um, allowed her to face the pain and the challenges that she was dealing with. Uh, and not to compartmentalize them and to move forward. But I know that really had an impact on you. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, Esther Fleece Allen is a fascinating person. I mean, even amidst her teenage years when she was abandoned by her parents and was, you know, going to different parents in the community and uh, school and church and what have you, she's getting straight A. She's an athlete. I mean, she certainly didn't seem like a victim, a survivor. Right. I mean, it's just, she just, Full steam ahead. I'm not going to be held back by this. So in one sense, it seems like, gosh, she is one remarkable human being. But yet she would say now that um, she was compartmentalizing them. As I think mm -hmm. another guest, uh, Karen Austin, I believe, said she was indeed stuffing these issues uh, and anger and all the emotions in the basement, you know. And from her perspective, she was indeed faking fine. And yeah, I mean, she exactly captured that uh, first book, No More Faking Fine, Ending the Pretending. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that's exactly what she was, she was doing. Um, but she made a decision that, um, you know, she was going to deal with this. You know, she was going to deal with these uh, emotions. Uh, she did some therapy. Uh, often writing a book can be therapeutic itself as you, you know, <laughs> write down these things was for me in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> and so she used what she went through as a springboard to, to help others, uh, to find, um, significance. You know, she began to thrive professionally and personally. She got married. Um, so I think, uh, Gary, you've, you've t spoken about, it. it's not really a coincidence that after publishing her book, that she right. met a husband and get and, and had a family, you know it well. So, yeah, what's yeah. your reflections on as she used that book and uh, to bounce forward, and she wasn't faking fine anymore. Oh, for sure. I mean, she was always someone who, even though she didn't have a model of it of a stable home life, she wanted to. She she craved from her soul. She craved to have that stable home life. Uh, but she found herself. She would joke, and it wasn't all joking, right? It was with joking. Sometimes it can be a little pain in there. And she would joke all the time. She was in everybody's wedding. All of her friends were getting married and she was in all those weddings, but there was no wedding for her. And, and in those, you know, in, in that place that she didn't talk about at parties, she, that, that, that wounded her heart. Um, but when the book came out, um, that the compartmentalization was over and she was indeed, she did indeed. Here's another bumper sticker for, for, for this show, ending the pretending. She stopped pretending. Um, as soon as that happened within a year, um, she met her, the man who would become her husband, the man who would then become father to her three children. And she is, I just saw her a couple of months ago. She is living um, a truly, truly significant life not only because of what she's doing professionally, helping others um, 
not fake fine, but just the 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 love and the joy that comes from out of her heart from being a, a mom is everything to her. So it's a great example of Esther's a great example of how running in place can turn into a life of significance for sure. It's it's also Esther's example is also a really good one of how running in place could look like success to others. Right. And Absolutely. right. And I think Warwick, your story is running in your running in place moment could look like success to others. Right. It, but it's really a reflection of how you feel. Right. Mm -hmm. Are you are you fulfilled? Does it feel like the significance that is out there for you? Um, I think that's really, really important because you may look really fine to everybody else, but you may feel stuck somehow inside. And that's what matters, right? There's a version of Esther's life that she had been living before that for someone else might right. be hitting your stride, but for her, it wasn't. There was a hole there that was, and she was you know, going through motions that look like to set success on the outside, but weren't quite in the, quite on the inside. So. Absolutely. And I think if you talk to Esther now, she, I'm sure would undoubtedly say, I hadn't fully processed every part of my crucible. It was still holding me back in some sense. I wouldn't have said yep. at the time, but you know, that is one sense of, you know, was it really holding her back from being fully who she was meant to be both professionally and personally, it would seem so because once she stopped faking fine and moved forward, things went to another level professionally and personally. It would right. seem like there's a link between her mindset shift and how things seem to go to a whole uh, other positive level professionally and personally. So yeah. there was certainly a link between her stopping faking fine. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll say the phrase again, I think, it's an example of she was moving. She had moved ahead in her career. She was, I mean, she worked for me and I hired her and I promoted her and she did a bunch of stuff, but she had not moved forward beyond her crucible. Once she did that, it was like in the, uh, I'm sure you guys aren't huge fans of the Fast and Furious movies. I am. It's like when they, they, they do a <laughs> shot of nitrous oxide to the engine and it makes them go faster, right? That's what, that's how Indeed. Esther's, Esther got <laughs> propelled in moving forward. That's, that's what can happen out of, um, out of this this running in place uh, 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 profile, the other uh, the the next guest that we're going to talk about here, folks, is Craig Para, um, and this is interesting. Listen to how I describe his story because you'll you'll hear a phrase that we've used before, and I didn't realize it started with him, but here we go. Uh, he was a corporate lawyer on a on the C suite track, but he had uh, he was beset by sexual and drug addiction, and uh, that left him at rock bottom in his career and his marriage bringing him uh, so low that he attempted suicide. His marriage almost fell apart and he lost his job because of his addiction. But then a mentor who had walked a similar path helped him overcome his demons enough through, uh, through structured behavioral change that allowed him to understand the underlying causes of his destructive ways, create new healthy habits, and save his relationship with his wife. The insights he received helped him move from simply moving ahead to moving forward. This is the part that just blew me away because Craig was one of the first maybe 15 guests we talked to. But his in, the in, uh, he came to realize life's most painful moments can actually be, wait for it, gifts. If they are harnessed to help us craft an intentional vision for moving forward with a purpose rooted in serving others. That's what he did. He's helped clients now in more than 27 countries reclaim hope and joy for their lives with his mindful habit system, which offers behavioral change insights anyone can apply to recover from crucibles of all stripes. So fascinating to me, Warwick, that we interviewed him a long time ago and we had a discussions about could your crucible be a gift and could it not and i totally had forgotten that craig is the one who started that concept with us so craig our apologies that we have forgotten that but indeed you're the first one to have dropped that wisdom on us that uh, crucibles can be gifts and they were for you because it led to that mindset shift is there anything warwick from from his story that you want to sort of pull out um i know you like pulling on the sweater strings of some of the things we talk about with guests is there are there any sweater strings in what i've said about craig that you want to sort of 
emphasize for folks? Yeah, I think in one sense, Craig was the prototype of faking fine. He was indeed living a double life. He was a successful business person, but yet he had, you know, just uh, addictions, both uh, drug and sexual addictions. But yet he seemed like, you know, full steam ahead, doing well in his career. And he was certainly doing an admirable job of faking fine. He was dying inside. Obviously, it was destroying his marriage. Um, but he came to the point where he dealt with this. He got, he got help. He admitted that he had a problem. Um, he found a way to use what he went through to help others. Um, I mean, it's truly remarkable. Uh, somebody beat to that story. The fact that he found a way to move forward with his mindful habit system, helping people all over the world. The fact that his marriage survived that is just, that is mind blowing. I, we had this conversation at the time. It's like there are not too many men or women, not too many spouses who are on the other side of this that would say, look, I've, you know, I'm done. I mean, drug, sexual addiction, but clearly they found a way to move forward. They found a way to forgive. No small thing. This isn't like, you know, uh, the little leagues of forgiveness. We're talking about a huge, huge thing to do. But they, may, they found a way to move forward in a new and productive way. And so, both personally and professionally, it's a remarkable story. But um, I think this is obviously not everybody's story of faking fine is quite so um, graphic, if you will. But ultimately, you can fake fine for only so long, but sooner or later, I feel like it's going to catch up with you. This is obviously a bit clearer, this one, but sooner or later, I don't care how adept you are. And we've talked about, you know, drug, sexual, alcohol addiction at cer a certain point. You know, you're running in place at a certain point, you know, you're going to fall flat in your face on the treadmill. You know, at a certain point, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that it's scientifically uh, provable. I wonder if you can really run in place forever without something happening. At least put it this way: you risk something happening, something bad happening if if you if you do that. Certainly, in his case, um, he made a decision that I just can't living. Uh, I can't keep living life like this. Yeah, and. Uh to help counterbalance that work, because you, you're right, this is a very um, outsized um, running in place story. Um, uh, the next guest that we're going to talk about had a had a had a smaller story in that in that sense. Whitney Singletary um, told a very sweet story when we interviewed her the first time. Right, she she baked her first batch of cookies in the California sun at age three with mud as her secret ingredient. This is how much she loved baking. She started baking with mud. Uh, ever since that day, she dreamed of being a baker. Um, but crafting that desire into a true vision she could execute proved difficult. And that's where the running in place began to happen for her. She suffered setbacks, including a physical assault, um, trying to open a store to bake and sell her cookies from, and then having to close it. Uh, the challenges of the pandemic that forced her to not be able to reopen uh, a, a, a a retail spot for her cookies. And she was always a step or two short of launching her dream of a life of significance through this. That's right. That life on the treadmill, um, your, your legs are moving, but you're not getting anywhere. That's where she was. That's what Whitney Singletary was going through. She couldn't get forward momentum, but she made the dream come true with her gourmet nut and butter cookies, nut and butter. It's nut butter, special exotic nut butter cookies. Um, she started selling the exotic confections from her driveway, finally beginning to move forward with a vision she was off the charts passionate about. And the fuel for that vision, why she kept moving toward trying to accomplish it, why she wasn't, she couldn't just rest forever in faking fine is because she wanted to build a life of significance for her two boys with her two boys. Um, this story was was moving, Warwick. Um, what are you know the beats that you and, and Cheryl? Please jump in. What are the beats that you guys pull out of uh, out of Whitney's story as they apply to to perhaps a lower wattage example of running in place? 
you know, life was not easy for, for Whitney Singletary. She was a single mom. She had two uh, small boys. Um, she, you know, where she lived in uh, her apartment or apartment building and neighborhood, there were, you know, people that, um, uh, you know, assaulted her. Um, I mean, it just life was not easy. And here she is, has this wonderful idea for nut and butter cookies using every nut you've heard of and some that most of us have not heard of. I mean, it wasn't just macadamia and almonds and walnuts. It was just some really exotic nuts from, you know, the far corners of the world. Um, it was a great vision. And she gets the storefront um, in uh, Oakland, uh, California, I think where she lives. And um, uh, you think, okay, this is going to happen. And between COVID and a variety of other things, she lost the lease. It's like, well, well, what do we do now? So it just feels like nothing's working. I'm trying to do this and um, I'm not, there's no way to make any forward progress. Uh, so uh, she got creative and said, well, maybe I can find a way to, uh, with flyers and other ways of advertising, let people know that I have this uh, gourmet cookie business from my neighborhood. And somehow uh, I think the local police found out about what she was doing and it spread like wildfire throughout the local police force saying, this stuff is great. You got to go get Whitney's cookies. And then when, yeah, exactly right. Uh, and when obviously she mentioned she didn't always feel safe in the neighborhood, it's like the local uh, police said, don't you worry about it. We'll make sure you're safe. You know, we'll kind of make it clear. You don't touch Whitney, you know, <laughs> so she's kind of under our protection, sort of like a, a kindly uncle or father kind of looking over your shoulder. So, um, I mean, and so she just, she never gave up and now she has a uh, <clears throat> thriving business that just helped her professionally and personally. And uh, she's somebody that um, just doesn't give up. But uh, yeah, she could have just been uh, in that running in place treadmill f forever, but she decided, okay, we're going to figure out another way of doing things. The storefront thing isn't working. And that's such an innovative idea just to sell it from her driveway. I mean, how can that possibly work? That was an incredible spark of a vision. But she's a very impressive woman. And um, yeah, I mean, she she wanted her two boys to have a good life. That was the motivating fact behind her vision. So it was hers is a remarkable story of perseverance and uh, creativity. And Cheryl, from from the one small step perspective, Selling gourmet cookies out of your driveway is a, is a pretty good uh, uh, one small step. I mean, that's one that fear did not did not hold back Whitney Singletary. She moved through that. That's a good example, right, of how you have to approach sometimes taking that that first step. It, it's not always going to be easy, and for her, that I mean, that was not easy. Absolutely, I think that's a great example of a vision. Um, probably a dual vision, right? A commitment to her children and giving them a better life and a commitment to knowing she was making a great product. And that, yeah. you know, and to say this vision, I can't not do this. And I'm going to take the small step, even if it means just every, everybody who passes by my house, <laughs> right. I'm going to introduce them to my cookies. And that, uh, I think that is a, that is the tenacity to really have a vision and commit to that vision and take that one small step. That's how you get the, that's how she got the flywheel moving, right? Mm -hmm. She said, I'm just going to go out and sell these cookies today, right? And then I'm going to go out the next day and do it. And that flywheel starts to move. That's a great example of not looking at, you know, not empire building and looking down the road at the long horizon, but just taking that, looking toward that, that first step and that next step. Yeah. It's a great, great example. What tenacity. Gary, earlier you half jokingly said, work's going to have a story for every profile. And we'll see, we'll see. Well, the jury's <laughs> out. We'll see if he does. But I think that that's a great example of the fact that these are not permanent states. These are moments in time. Mm -hmm. they, the profiles allow you to decode where you're at right now and really self-reflect on where you're at right now, understand it, and know what you need to do to take that next step forward. 
So it's entirely possible to live all these profiles or to live mm -hmm. the same profile after um, different crucibles. And I think that that's a great point, that this is not a permanent state of being. This is a moment in time that and a, and a leaping forward point. Talking about cookies, works made me hungry. So um, <laughs> we've, we've reached a point in the show anyways, good timing, um, where uh, we pretty much wrapped up the things um, that, that we wanted to talk about. I just, uh, as always, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for, we've, we've talked about a lot. We've, we've covered a lot that we prepared to cover. As always, we covered a lot of stuff that just came up in our conversation, which is awesome. Um, what are the you know, thoughts you want to leave uh, listeners and viewers with today? Yeah, I like what Cheryl said um, about, uh, you know, these are moments in time, uh, these profiles. They not don't have to define the rest of your life. For most people, you might think, oh, life is meant to be kind of boring and a drudgery. But I think what we've heard from the stories we've talked about and our discussions, it's really about a mindset shift. It's about saying, I'm not going to be stuck in the gray. I'm going to live a technicolor life. I'm going to thrive and not survive. And some of the keys to that is really examining yourself. If you're living in the gray, you might have think you've fully processed your crucible, but have you? If you had, wouldn't you be moving ahead? Wouldn't life be a little bit mm -hmm. more, you know, uh, I don't know about exciting, but a little less uh, boring or drudgery? Do some of that inner work, whether it's talking to a counselor, pastor, trusted friend, family member. And as you're doing the inner work to, to understand it, just make a decision saying, I'm, I'm going to get off this treadmill. You know, I'm going to make a decision to get off and find one small step. I mean, it might be like Whitney Singletary deciding I'm going to sell, you know, cookies on my driveway. In my case, it was. I'm going to go to a woman who's an executive coach that does uh, mid-career assessments. That's not a massive step. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen out of that, and it turned up, I ended up in executive coaching, but it's just making that small step. So really, uh, the key to getting out of uh, running in place and to thriving, to hitting your stride, is making a decision, I'm going to get off the treadmill, I'm going to see if there's any vestiges or strings in my um that is still holding me back from my crucible and i'm going to make a decision to move forward even if it feels like a baby step i'm going to trust myself i'm going to move forward and so really the probably the biggest key to getting out of uh, running a place it's a mindset shift it's a choice i'm going to choose to begin to think okay how do i get off this treadmill how do i move forward and taking a small step over small, one small step can lead to another. But the key is just that that mindset shift that I think is probably the most helpful people are in this profile. Folks, I've been in the communications business long enough to know when the final word's been spoken on a subject and Warwick Fairfax, former running in place profile person, <laughs> uh, has just spoken that word. Um, so if you want to join us on this journey, to continue to join us on this journey, head over to beyondthecrucible.com right now and take the free self-assessment. You'll get your results right away and you can discover where you are on the map right now and how you can get from, wh from where you're at to, how, to where you need to go to live your unique life of significance. So head to beyondthecrucible.com and take the assessment and be sure to join us next week when we start to explore another map as we move on our journey from trials to triumphs. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.